This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. I am pretty pumped for week number eight in the NFL. Looking ahead right now, the schedule does not look too shabby. There are not a lot of high scoring games, but there are some pretty fun slash interesting games on the schedule. Unfortunately, most of them are not in prime time as those spreads are all eight and a half as of right now, but still pretty fun week ahead. We're going to dive into week eight later on. I'll talk about where my model is showing value for this week over at FanDuel Sportsbook. But first, we're going to talk about the futures market and dig into the Baltimore Ravens, discuss whether they have the ceiling to take down the whole kit and caboodle this year with Ryan Williams and get his read on the futures market for this week. This is covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and FanDuel Research. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a managing editor of digital media for FanDuel Research. Joined here, as mentioned, by Ryan Williams. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Ryan, heading into week number eight. How are you doing today? Man, week eight. We're almost to the midway point of the season. I can't believe it, Jim. It feels like we just started. I know. Um, it, it's ridiculous. But no, I'm feeling I'm feeling good, man. I'm feeling good about, you know, our picks last night. I'm um, feeling good about, you know, the state of the, the state of the slate for week eight. Uh, and we got some some midseason uh, uh, picks to to be able to dissect next week for the people. So uh, it's it's all it's all good stuff happening over here on covering the spread. Yeah, you kind of saved the podcast last week because I had a pretty bad week seven. So luckily you were able to swoop in and kind of salvage things at the last second. Thank you for that, as always, saving my skin there. Um, But yeah, I think that week eight is setting up pretty well. Pretty fun games there. And like you said, I think there's some value out there to be had entering week eight. We're talking about the Ravens specifically, and we talk about their outlook here in just one second. But first, a reminder to make sure you're subscribed to Covering the Spread wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. If you like what you hear, leave us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can also find us on the FanDuel YouTube page and FanDuel TV+. Plus. Let's start things off here, Ryan, by talking about the Baltimore Ravens. Huge win for them over the Detroit Lions this past week. And as things stand right now, the Ravens Super Bowl odds are 12 to 1. So when you look at this Ravens team, what to you is their ceiling? Like, are we talking them as a consideration to win the whole thing? Or are they more so divisional markets, conference markets? Where do you think we're looking at for the ceiling of this Baltimore team? Yeah, I mean, the, the divisional market uh, is, is one that you think is pretty much theirs to lose. I mean, even right now, they're, they're still minus 105. And you know how often I, or how much I've been talking about the Cincinnati Bengals, yeah. um, which, you know, as far as like shots in the dark to think, I think they're one of the the, the better ones, uh, just knowing how many divisional matchups are left in the AFC North. But yeah, I think right now the, the Baltimore Ravens, they kind of control – their own destiny, you know, they're not talked about in the same breath as, you know, like the Buffalo Bills, the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, the Cincinnati Bengals, the Miami Dolphins for this year, if you will. But this this team, you know, and shout out to, you know, Todd Monk and, you know, let's give the guys some credit. We were all kind of talking about, oh, it's going to be a different look offense. We're going to see, you know, more explosive plays and things like that. The way the season kind of started for them, uh, you know, it wasn't coming to fruition. But now you see that, you know, come through where Lamar, you know, he's throwing for over 300 yards as a passer. I believe he was maybe he was right behind Mahomes because Mahomes had like his the Lamar's yardage total like halfway through the third quarter. Right. Just, you know, doing <laughs> Mahomes things. But, you know, for Lamar to be able to put up 350, you know, throw for three touchdowns, rush for a touchdown, have a passer rating over 150. Uh, we talked about him a couple weeks ago, you know, be, being a good value uh, to be MVP. And now you're looking at him seven to one to win the MVP race. Like that's how quickly these things can change when, you know, teams are coming into the forefront. And so, yeah, I think for me, the ceiling, I still don't know if I'm ready to place them uh, as the AFC representative in the Super Bowl. Um, you know, even at the at the twelve to one odds that seem kind of favorable, six to one to win the AFC. I'm sorry, it's twelve to one to win the Super Bowl. But uh, it 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 is looking like if this defense, the defense really is the one that I'm looking at. If they can stay healthy and on the field, they are going to cause problems uh, for teams and. 
you know, just the fact that Zay Flowers is getting going. Um, we're hoping that OBJ can stay healthy for, for Baltimore as he seems to be kind of like a security blanket for Lamar when Mark Andrews isn't open. But, um, you know, they, they'll, they're going to figure out the running back situation. There's still like moves to be made too, Jim, yeah. that can like change up landscapes as we haven't like yet got to the, the trade deadline. And so I'm interested to see how that kind of shakes out. Not to say that Baltimore may or may not be in the mix, but like, you know, I'm thinking of teams where, you know, running backs are available and like if they could trade, if they traded for a guy who was like a slam dunk play, that would be crazy. So I, I love this Baltimore team. Uh, I love the traction that we've been getting on them all season right now. I think for this week, we're going to hold Pat, but it would not surprise me to see them, you know, win a game or two in the playoffs. For sure. Um, and I think that I'm on board with you where I think that they're properly accounted for in the market. But I think that if I were to give a counterpoint here to myself um, in saying that I'm not interested at 12 to one just now, if I look at my model and run it without a prior um, and priors do still matter even at this point in the year, because it's still small samples. But like if I look at just 2023 data, the Ravens rank sixth in my offensive power rankings and third on defense. And that's with all the injuries they've had. Like, that's not giving them a bump up for the guys like Ronnie Stanley, Tyler Linderbaum, uh, Odell Beckham, Rashad Bateman, Marlon Humphrey. Like, all these guys who have missed time for them, both offensively and defensively, they're still in the top six in both numbers. So, overall, they rank second for me right now. Again, just for 2023, behind the 49ers. So, I think that'd be the counterpoint, is that they can kind of hang with those top-end teams because of what they've done so far this year and a year where they've had a lot of injuries and a lot of weird luck. So yeah. I think they're at least worth a consideration at 12 to one. I have not taken this myself and probably will not, but I'm at least more interested Ryan than I thought I'd be before I dug into what the data was saying. Yeah. I, I, I think that they are, you know, I, I definitely like their chances um, to go a little bit further than Miami. Miami's just had such an easy road to the schedule. Like this Baltimore team, and we talked about it before, like the the games early on in the season, they, they could have been looking at being undefeated, you know, being in the close matchups and just Brad Bricks going their way. But um, – yeah, they're definitely they're, they're they're definitely in the mix. I just feel like the the top teams right now are the top teams for a reason, uh, and I'm gonna you know keep keep the respect there for now. I will be doing the exact same thing. Okay, let's talk about other teams who saw their stock rise across week seven. Ryan, beyond just Baltimore, who got the biggest boost for you based on what we saw from week seven and before then as well. Yeah, let's uh, talk about the um, Atlanta Falcons right now, which I guess it's going to be kind of twofold for me because it talks about another team. I'm going to talk about another team in the AFC or NFC South that uh, is a downgrade for me. But the Atlanta Falcons, you know, they're just kind of going out there and, you know, when I guess winning games every other week, but they're kind of winning the games that they, you know, should be winning. Uh, the commander's loss that they had uh, two weeks ago is a, is a tough one. It's a tough pill to swallow there. But these teams that are in the NFC South are not separating themselves um, from from the Atlanta Falcons any way, shape or form. You know, the Carolina Panthers, they're they're basically out of it like there's no no shot to take them at 60 to one, uh, even where things stand. Uh, the New Orleans Saints talk about later. Tampa Bay Buccaneers, kind of same type of thing. There's plus 100 to win the South. Like, I feel pretty good about that. They have one of the easier, if not the easiest schedules in the NFL, like, remaining. They get to play the Titans, the Falcons, the Cardinals, the Saints, the Jets, the Bucks, the Panthers, and then the Colts, um, and then the Bears and Saints to round up the season. Like, I'm throwing out these teams. These are not, you know, playoff teams, playoff caliber teams, winning teams. Um, so they kind of control their own destiny again in, in the South. And I, and I do like them uh, to win some of these games here as they have, you know, uh, I'm looking at four, four, actually four and four, four and, uh, home games and uh, five road games to finish out the season. But, you know, we've shown that they have the propensity to win on the road as they just did in Tampa. Um, so I, I, I like this team. I like what Arthur Smith is doing there. I like the, the way the defense is playing. You know, Desmond Ritter um, can keep – can keep things afloat here. You like to see that the guy, the guys in the offense, and that's the passing game. Don't know what's going on in the rushing game, but the passing game at least is getting going. We hope that Bijan will be able to get things going here soon. So I like the Falcons' outlook uh, to plus one hundred to win the NFC South. 
Yeah, you mentioned uh, their schedule, and their schedule probably going to get easier too as the week goes along because it seems like Ryan Tannehill is trending towards not playing in week number eight. And based on what we saw from Malik Willis last year in that very short action uh, before after Tannehill got hurt a couple weeks ago too, and based on the fact that Will Levis has not taken that spot over yet, that's a pretty big downgrade for Tennessee if Tannehill cannot go in this match with Atlanta. So again, another boost for them, even in a, an overall easier schedule. Now I'm not going to say they're a lock to be the Mike Vrabel team because Vrabel does some really weird stuff uh, when he's back into a corner. Yeah. Uh, so maybe they'd still wind up being okay, but they do benefit there from a schedule perspective as well. Now you mentioned the saints. They're plus plus one seventy five right now to win the NFC South. They're coming off a tough, tough loss to the Jaguars and I think the concerning thing, Ryan, at that matchup was the defense because the offense has been what it is, and it did show some life there, but the defense has been pretty rock solid. They were not once they finally faced a pretty good offense there. So it sounds like you're down the Saints as well, entering week number eight. Yeah, they just uh, they they just don't look good, Jim. They just don't look good in any capacity, stretch, or form. I, I guess I shouldn't disrespect Alvin Kamara like that because <laughs> he had been disrespected coming into all this season, and he's just, you know, out there um, and pretty much, you know, being a, being a Swiss Army knife out of, out of the backfield as we know him to be um, with his, you know, crazy reception totals um, right. that, are, that are pretty much on pace to break, you know, a lot of records out of the backfield there. But other than that, um, Derek Carr, I, I don't know. I mean, it, the stuff that he's doing on the sidelines, you know, reacting to Chris Olave, possibly not running the right route, but you could just, you know, he's not been able to keep his composure there um, for quite some time, a quite the past couple of weeks. And that's just not a Derek Carr that we're used to seeing from the Raiders. So I just think like the, the stuff that's happening, like maybe off the field is kind of transitioning onto the field. Uh, you're saying the defense as well too, giving up some points. Now I will say the one caveat, about the the Saints as well is that they do have a pretty you know easy schedule as well for looking at the the out of uh, division po- opponents or out of conference opponents as well for the Atlanta Falcons you know that still carries some weight to the same t- similar team in the same division so um, they do have some chances but I just have not seen it yet and I'm not willing to you know put put any stock into this team that really has just shown struggles uh time and time again and are kind of basically getting by by their namesake like we're not used to seeing the Saints struggle in this capacity and I feel like you know people are people are uh giving them the benefit of the doubt but uh the doubt's creeping in Jim doubt's creeping in. it's it's definitely there for sure and it's concerning because I did like the Saints coming into this year I thought that Derek Carr Coming in to be an upgrade of Randy Dalton, and, you know, so far the offense has struggled. Is it because of Carr's shoulder injury or something else? I don't know. Uh, offensive line has struggled for sure, but, like, whatever the reasoning is, it has not been good, for sure, for the Saints, and that is a pretty big issue for them going forward. Any other futures you're targeting? Entering week number eight, Ryan? Yeah, we're going to go... Um... We're gonna be- go back to the to the squad here um, with with the Buffalo Bills, and you know I, I know that most people will say stock down for them. Uh, I just I just still believe in the talent. Um, I still believe in you know the the offense and defensive uh, prowess. And when you're looking at the Miami Dolphins there, who who are the favorite by by you know a pretty wide margin there at being minus one sixty compared to plus one seventy five for the Bills to win the AFC East, like the Miami Dolphins have not beaten anybody with a re- winning record, you know, and it, they got boat raced by Buffalo um, in their same division. Uh, the Eagles pretty much controlled the whole state of that game. Um, and I just feel like the Miami Dolphins, while well, they'll get healthy on defense, like they're, they're pretty fragile here. Like they, they are, you know, they're, I don't know if they're made to stand the test of time, so to speak, but Buffalo has been there before. Um, I still trust in, I still trust in what McDermott does. I still trust in Allen, even though he, you know, he's been turnover prone as of late, but I'm still willing to take shots on the Buffalo bills where I can. And then similarly in that same vein, the running back situation for the Bills is just absolutely atrocious. And, you know, I, I know you've talked about James Cook a time time and time again, and I'm not saying that the dude can't play. Um, they're just not utilizing the, these yeah. backs in the way that you would expect. Like Latavius Murray has been talked about uh, of getting some run, and that just is, like, worrisome knowing how uh, old Latavius Murray is. So when we go into the futures, uh, and I'm looking at it to pull it up, I believe he's – 
12 to one. Um, and that's Stefan Diggs to lead the league in receiving yards. He's, okay. you know, kind of, a, he's a little bit far behind Tyreek Hill, even that much further behind AJ Brown, but at 12 to one to, you know, lead the league in receiving yards, you know, this guy's capable of putting up, you know, a hundred yards per game for the rest of the season type of thing. Um, you know, barring no any injuries. And, and he really is just a guy like Dawson Knox is now banged up. Uh, Gabe Davis has not been able to get going. No other receiver is there. Dalton Kincaid is probably um, the second favorite target uh, for Josh Allen if we're going forward. So I do like getting some action on Stephon Diggs there. And I think the other thing that's beneficial for that, and it might not work out well for the Bills' divisional odds, which I do like. I agree with you, where I think that they're a good value there. But the other thing that benefits Stephon Diggs in this market is that the Bills' defense is very banged up. And they're probably going to be in more shootouts this year than what they've had in previous years as a result of that. So when you're in more shootouts, that forces more throwing, that forces uh, more back and forth affairs. And that's how you get like true upside in these markets. Now, Diggs currently is 678 receiving yards. Uh, Tyree Kill is 902. Um, so pretty big lead there, but there is a long way to go. Things can happen. Yep. I think that's a very interesting bet, Ryan, both because it's Diggs, but also because, again, I think this defense having all the injuries is going to force the Bills to be a bit more aggressive. And they've shown that when they get in shootouts, the guy they're going to lean on is Stephon Diggs. Yeah, ab absolutely. And this is a guy who I believe has finished – top three in two of the past four seasons did finish one um in 2021 2020 2020 one, one of those two seasons i have to go back yeah. and look it up through through my notes but i say that to say he's been in the mix since joining the buffalo bills and you know well, let's put some respect on his name um at being 12 to 1 the other one that i think um is interesting if we're if we're looking forward um and it doesn't feel that great right now um as it stands but i'm still gonna maybe go back to the chargers uh making the playoffs uh it's two to one right now 205 i believe that's what we have it on the FanDuel sportsbook uh and they just when you're looking at their schedule like they do have a lot of winnable games coming up um they're you know they're gonna have to play the lions uh in three weeks uh they're also gonna have get to play the ravens but at home uh, and then they're going to play the Bills, but also that game is at home, and then they get a Chiefs game at home. So, you know, they just lost on the road to the Chiefs, a tough matchup for them as well. But playing against teams like the Jets, the Packers, the Patriots, the Raiders, the Broncos twice, um, they do still have some merit. And with seven teams making the playoffs, like we could see um, them turn the tide, um, especially, you know, if they're if they're able to get things going here. I know the defense has kind of been a little bit concerning, but they were in that game with the Cowboys on Monday night two weeks ago. Um, they really have only lost game. You know, they've been in one score games pretty much all season. They lost to the Dolphins by two week one, uh, lost to the Titans in overtime by three. This team has kind of been in the mix. So I'm willing to take a shot on them uh, to potentially make the playoffs there at 205. It is very painful, but you are likely correct. Uh, I'm still trying to get over the Chargers. Uh, did that game against Dallas, that very, very yep. annoying game. And like, I do still have, again, the Chargers inside the top 10 of my power rankings, both in the model that includes the prior still. And if I look at just 2023, but I don't want to do it. <laughs> I, I'm just so, <laughs> I've been so burned by this team so many times. Yep. And like yep. the justification, the excuse I'll use is a Mike Williams injury. But like, honestly, Ryan, it is just because my feelings are hurt. Like that's the only reason I'm not, I'm not buying into this team is just my feelings are hurt. Although I did bet them for sorry, yep. uh, week eight uh, against the bears. I did lay the points uh, in the Tyson Bajan game. So I guess I'm not totally off the chargers. Unfortunately, it's at the expense of your bears, but Hey, helps the draft pick, right? <laughs> hey, you got to do, you got to do what you got to do. Do what the model's telling you, Jim. That's right. Well, that's exactly what we'll do in just a bit. We'll take a look here at week eight lines, but first Ryan, want to thank you for swinging by for today. As always, good luck to you in week number eight. We'll talk to you once again, Monday to talk about Jared Goff and the Raiders for Monday night football next week. We'll talk to you then. Sounds good. I'm looking forward to it. Good luck. 
All righty. That is Ryan Williams. Make sure you check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W uh, to get his read on all things NFL over there. We're going to dive into week number eight and talk about where my model is showing value here in just one second. But first, snap into action this NFL season with FanDuel America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. That is $200 in bonus bets, win or lose. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, there is no better time to get in on the action. The app is so easy to use. There's a wide range of betting options, including spreads, player props, totals, and more. So visit FanDuel.com and kick off the NFL season. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL, must be 21 plus and present in select states. FanDuel is offering online sports wagering in Kansas under an agreement with Kansas Star Casino LLC. First online real money wager only, $10 first deposit required. Bonus issued is not withdrawable bonus bets that expire seven days after receipt. Restrictions apply. See terms at sportsbook.fanduel.com. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER or visit fanduel.com slash RG in Colorado, Iowa, Michigan, New Jersey, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Illinois, Tennessee, and Virginia. Call 1-800-NEXT-STEP or text next step to 53342 in Arizona. 1-888-789-7777 or visit ccpg.org slash Jack Connecticut. 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana. 1-800-522-4700. Visit ksgamblinghealth.com in Kansas. 1-877-770-STOP in Louisiana. Visit mdgamblinghealth.org in Maryland. 1-800-GAMBLER.net in West Virginia. Or call 1-800-522-4700 in Wyoming. Hope is here. Visit gamblinghelplinema.org. Or call 800-327-5050 for 24-7 support in Massachusetts. Or call 1-877-HOPE-NY or text open y in New York. Let's take a look now at where my model is showing value across week number eight at FanDuel Sports. We begin with a pretty fun game, actually. That is the Rams at the Cowboys. And my numbers show value in the Rams, both on the spread and the money line. So what I want to do here is take a little bit of both. I want to put enough on the spread where I profit if the Rams wind up covering, but then put some on the money line as well to give myself upside should the Rams wind up winning this game outright. The spread right now is plus six and a half. The Rams money line is plus 225. And obviously here it's the Cowboys at home coming off a bye. And those things do matter quite a bit. But I think this number overall undersells the Rams. The Rams offense has faced a really tough string of defenses. And they grade out well offensively once you make the adjustment for the opponents they have faced. They rank ninth in my offensive power rankings after adjusting for schedule. That's ignoring all priors. Whereas Dallas is just 18th. That's kind of funky. And I think that gap will tighten as the year goes along. But the Rams have played well so far. And at least on offense, they're still relatively healthy. Even when you account for the Cowboys bye week, my model makes a spread at 3.1 points. So quite a bit of value at six and a half. It is minus 115 at FanDuel. Um, so make sure you're accounting for that as well, because minus 115 is pretty decent uh, price to pay. But that is also why I'll take a bite at the money line as well. The implied odds of plus 225 are 30.8%. My model is Rams at 38.4% to win this game. So again, layering this bet where I put uh, you put enough on the spread uh, in order to profit should they cover, but then put some on the money line as well in order to give yourself upside should the Rams wind up winning this game outright. So to me, I think the Rams are the preferred side of this game. I do feel pretty good about them and am okay with the Rams plus six and a half and a bit on the money line at plus 225. Second bet of the week is going to be in a pretty gross game. I mean, I'm kind of excited for it because I like watching this Jets offense now that they're actually willing to trust Zach Wilson, but I actually want to bet on the opposing side. That is the New York Giants who are currently plus three at FanDuel Sportsbook. Uh, That is minus 115. And I think that the Giants are a bit undervalued for the second consecutive week. Talked about that with Ed last week against the Commanders. They won that game outright, and I think they're undervalued here. Now, the two factors to consider here is that, A, this is a neutral field because it is in East East Rutherford. I care about travel, and there's no travel for the Jets. Different locker room. Um, I guess it might not be a different locker room, but either way, no travel for the Jets. So no home field advantage, and the Jets are coming off their bye whereas the Giants played last week. So a couple of bumps up for the Jets in what is, in theory, an away game. I'm guessing that this number is as heavily in favor of the Jets is because the Jets have had 
I would say improvements on offense. Ever since they switched this let it rip philosophy uh, on the offensive side before their buy, where Nathaniel Hackett is letting Zach Wilson throw an early downs, which he should do, because if you want to, you know, send your quarterback into a tailspin, a very good way to do so is having him throw exclusively on late downs in bad situations. They're letting him actually be in advantageous spots now, and the offense has looked better. Even though if we look at just those three games with this new approach, Wilson's at negative 0.02 passing net expected points per dropback. Again, NEP is number fires expected points model. League average tends to be around 0.1. It's been lower this year, but regardless, Wilson has been below average. Even when you look at just three, three games with this new approach. Now, that's a better number than where he was at before. And it does help that he faced a Chiefs defense and there has played very, very well. So it's a it's a decently impressive mark from Zach Wilson, but it's also still not the model of efficiency on the giant side of things. They seem likely to get left tackle Andrew Thomas back this week after a pretty long absence. That's a boost up for them, especially against a very good defensive line. I honestly don't care whether it's Daniel Jones or Terod Taylor. Probably maybe that's wrong. I don't know, but like you know, Trod's played pretty well so far. So uh, I'm okay. Not making a huge adjustment based on who plays quarterback for the giants. And if anything, it'd be an upgrade if Jones were able to go, which would help the model a bit here, which does view this game as basically a toss up. Uh, I do have the jets as slight favorites here, but not enough to justify laying three points in this situation. So I like the Giants plus three. That is minus 115 at FanDuel Sportsbook. You could take their money line at plus 130 again because um, I do view this as a pretty tight game. The reason I'm inclined to take the points is because the total here is so low. It's 36 and a half. And when you get points in a very low total game and you're showing value there, I think that's pretty hard to turn down. My model actually does view this total as being justifiable. Uh, I've got a 36.3, and it's a 36 and a half. So low total, we're getting points. I think that all aligns well, where the Giants are good value for this week. at plus three again, that's minus 115 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Final bet I want to mention for this week, or final money line or spread I want to mention for this week is in a game that I'm pretty jazzed for, that is the Pittsburgh Steelers hosting the Jacksonville Jaguars. Now, if you listen to this show a lot since the start of last year, you're probably going to think that I'm on the Jags here because I've been on the Jags a lot, and it's been very profitable and very fun. But I think this is a bit too low on Pittsburgh, given how well they played. If I look at my model that ignores prior, so not looking at uh, expectations coming into this year, Pittsburgh ranks 21st in my offensive power rankings, despite playing without Deontay Johnson for most of the year. That is a worse mark than Jacksonville, to be sure. The two defenses have actually been pretty similar so far this year, and that's a compliment to the Jags because the Steelers' defense is very good. So to me, it is clear that Jacksonville is a better team in this matchup. I just don't know if they're better enough to justify being two and a half point road favorites against a team that has played pretty solid football so far this year. So again, I view this as being a pretty close matchup between these two teams. We're getting plus 128 on the Steelers in this spot. I think that's enough to justify buying in to Pittsburgh here. Do I want to buy into a team that is probably going to get some buzz this week because they beat the Rams? Not really. Um, you know, it could mean that they're overvalued in this spot, but at least based on just my model, I think Pittsburgh is a good value of plus 128 to win this game. So it pains me to bet against my Jags in this spot, but I'm going to follow me where the numbers tell me to go and, or follow where the numbers tell me to go. And they tell me to go on the Steelers here at plus 128. So I'm going to take that personally for this one. Final bet for me is on Monday night football. That is between the Raiders and the Lions. Where right now the total in this game is 44 and a half. And I'm going to take the over on that one at FanDuel Sports because I'm showing a lot of value on that side of things. Uh, it's at 45 in most spots, and I think it should be at 45 at FanDuel as well. I think it's there for good reason. Although the pace in this game is pretty low, and that does matter quite a bit, both offenses can move the ball when they're healthy. I'm expecting Jimmy Garoppolo to play here, and even with the, the interceptions he has thrown this year, Garoppolo has still been efficient when healthy. He's been above league average when he's been healthy so far this year. The Lions got torched by the Ravens last week. Kind of no other way to put it, but I don't think that's a huge long-term concern for them. They're back at home here facing a lesser defense than the Ravens. 
and they're indoors, which is a benefit as well. So my model actually puts the total for this game at 49.8 in part because it does show the Lions covering in this game. And if they're going to cover an eight and a half point spread, there kind of has to be a lot of points scored in the game. So I do show value in the over here. 49.8 again is my number. Before it gets to 45, I would want to take it. I'd take it at 45 too, honestly, because I'd still show a good amount of value there. I think you could also consider parlaying uh, the Lions with the spread or with the over on the total here. I would note that if you're doing this at FanDuel, they know that those two bets are correlated uh, to get to over 44 and a half points when you're betting a team to cover an eight and a half point spread. So that's why if you parlay them, it's plus 235. They're not dummies. They know what they're doing. So like, you're not going to pull one over on them by doing that. But I do think there is a bit of value there. Both those bets individually are values based on my model and they do correlate pretty well also. So I'm not opposed to that with the Lions, but we'll go with for today over 44 and a half minus 115 at FanDuel Sportsbook. So the four bets I am on for this week in week number eight are going to be the Lions Raiders over 44 and a half minus 115, the Steelers money line plus 128, the Giants plus three against the Jets at minus 115, and the Rams plus six and a half uh, with a sprinkle on the Rams money line as well at plus 225 against the Dallas Cowboys. That's going to close up shop for the week eight first look. Before we dive into or week week eight first look, before we dive uh, close up shop for today overall, we got to go back to last week and recap recommendations from here on the show. And like I said, rough week for the podcast overall. Ed Fang uh, was our guest here uh, on the college football and NFL side of things. Find Ed on Twitter at the Power Rank and check out his work at thepowerrank.com. Ed went one and one for this week. I like Penn State a lot in that game against Ohio State. Uh, he said to either take them plus four and a half, take their team total over 20 and a half, or take the over for the game at 45 and a half against Ohio State. And Ohio State's defense continued to play very good football. They've done that in a small sample, but like they keep doing it. So kudos to them for the win. Uh, they won that game 20 to 12. So Hopefully it took just one route to this game, uh, but either way, all three of those routes did not get there. So good win for Ohio State and no win on the college side of things. Ed, though, did like the Giants plus three against the Commanders. They won that game outright. I mentioned that I was on that one as well. I did like it uh, quite a bit. Didn't really understand why the Commanders were getting that much love, uh, but the Giants played well. Terod Taylor again playing pretty well, and I think that does how we feel better about taking them against the Jets in week number eight. Again, follow Ed Fang on Twitter at the power rank. We had JJ Zacharyson on to talk some player props last week. JJ is on Twitter at late round QB. Find his work at late round.com and the late round fantasy football podcast. JJ was due for some regression because he's been really good so far this year. One and three for the week. The hit was Isaiah Pacheco over 14 and a half receiving yards at minus 114. Pacheco, I think at 28 yards, but also a touchdown through the air. So uh, doubled up his receiving yardage prop there. Misses were Christian Watson over 53 and a half receiving yards. He got hurt uh, pretty late in that game. Not sure if it impacted this one, but did get hurt uh, at some point there. Chris Godwin, anytime touchdown. He's going to score eventually. Uh, his usage is too good not to. Then Puka Nakua had uh, JJ had him for anytime touchdown, but Nakua went nuts. So unfortunate week from a results perspective, but I think the process was definitely there for JJ. Again, follow him on Twitter at late round QB. Mentioned that Ryan did well in last night's game. That does include the spread. He liked the Vikings plus six and a half against the 49ers. And of course, they won that game outright. So good call by Ryan there. Ryan and I both liked the over in that game at 43. Obviously, that did not hit. Looked for a bit like it might, but uh, that turnover late by the 49ers offense prevented things from getting there. That was a 43 and the under hit on that one. Player props went very well for Ryan. He had George Kittle over 47 and a half receiving yards. That hits. He had Kittle uh, at five plus receptions at plus 132. That hit as well. Did not get the Kittle anytime touchdown, but getting the plus 132 on five plus receptions uh, was good for Ryan for sure. He had TJ Hawkinson over 49 and a half receiving yards. That one hit as well pretty early in that game. KJ Osborne didn't do a ton, but did go over 41 and a half receiving yards. I think he had 47, so that one hit too. The one Mr. Ryan and the player props was Juwan Jennings for an in-time touchdown. That was plus 480. Jennings did play a pretty good role in this game, but no touchdown there. So overall, really good day uh, from Ryan on the show last night. Again, follow Ryan at Ryan Alexander underscore W. Rough week for me, one and three in the NFL side of things. I had the Dolphins money line, the Lions money line, and the Bucks minus two and a half. And the Lions and Dolphins money lines both moved against me, and they should have because those were bad recommendations that did not hit. Uh, so 
probably bad process and bad results there, which at least makes it feel a bit better, uh, better than losing when you had good process. Bucks minus two and a half. I, I don't know. The Falcons fumbled twice towards the goal line. They probably should have won by more than they did. So it felt like it was close, but honestly, probably didn't deserve that one either. The one hit felt good about this one is the Broncos Packers under 45. That one pretty comfortably under. So uh, the hit was good, but overall rough. We can look into bounce, uh, bounce back in week number eight. NASCAR did not go well either. Uh, in the truck series, like Christian Eckes, 9-1 to one to win there. He had a speeding penalty, had another penalty earlier on in that race. So kind of shot himself in the foot uh, throughout that race, did not win there. I had Austin Hill at 9-1 to one and Chandler Smith 11-1 to one in Xfinity. Smith had some issues pretty early on that race. He had a wreck and I think blew up uh, later on. Hill was 9-1, to one, but couldn't quite catch Sam Mayer. Mayer was very, very fast late in that race. Riley Herbst was fast, too, once again. So no win for Austin Hill or Chandler Smith. In the Cup Series, I had Alex Bowman, plus 170, uh, to finish top 10. Bowman was pretty fast and looked good in practice. So I felt good about this bet going into the race and showed a lot of value on it on Sunday morning as well. But he got... I don't know. His first run was kind of weird and got pinned a lap down, never really could make up for it. I think he might've had an issue on pit road too. So he got back in the lead lap late, but didn't really have a shot to uh, cash that bet. So rough week overall, probably the worst week week I've had so far this year, but we'll see how things go in week number eight. That's all we got here for today on covering the spread. Want to give a big thank you once again to Ryan Williams, our guest. Check him out on Twitter at Ryan Alexander underscore W. I am on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J I M S A N N E S. You can also follow me on threads at Jim Sonnes and check out FanDuel Research at FanDuel Research. We are back once again tomorrow talking college football week number nine. We'll hope to talk to all of you then. This has been covering the spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. 